half years younger than him. Well, he's sort of 14 and a half and I'm sort of 16, you know. It might have been a failing of mine to tend to sort of talk down to him because I'd known him as a younger kid. He was always uh, nine months older than I. Even now, he's still nine months older than me. <laughs> Paul met me the first day I did Bebopalula live on stage. And a, a mutual friend brought him to see my group called the Quarrymen. I had a mate at school who was called Ivan, Ivan Vaughan. And we were born on exactly the same day in Liverpool, so we, we were great mates. And uh, one day he said, do you want to come to the Wilton Village Fete? So I said, yeah, all right. So we went along one Saturday afternoon. I remember coming into uh, the field where they had the fete and just a bit over there, there was a wagon uh, and on the back of this, or a little stage or something, on the, on, up on this stage, there was a few lads around and there was one particular guy I noticed at the front had a sort of checked shirt, sort of blondish kind of hair, a little bit curly, sideboards, looking pretty cool. And he was playing sort of one of these guitars, guaranteed not to crack, you know, not a very good one. But, um, but he was making a very good job of it, you know, and I remember being quite impressed. And he was doing a song by the Dell Vikings called Come Go With Me. And the thing about it was, he obviously didn't know the words, but he was pulling in lyrics from blues songs. So instead of going, uh, come little darling, come and go with me, which is, the, is right, he'd then go, down, down, down to the penitentiary. And he'd be doing some of the stuff he'd heard on Big Bill Brunsey records and stuff. So I thought, that's clever. That's the, he's, he's pretty good. That was John. And we met and we talked after the show, and I, I saw he had talent, and he was playing guitar backstage and doing 20 Flight Rock by Eddie Cochran. Ooh, well, I gotta get over the red machine When it comes to rock, and she's a queen We love to dance on a Saturday night but the thing I think impressed him most was um, I knew all the words. Feet. This went on for a couple of days, but I couldn't stay away. So I walked one, two, five, three, five, four, five, six, seven, nine, if I'm more. One, twelve, I'm starting to say. Fifteen, four, I'm ready to drag. I get to the top, I'm too tired to rock. I was the singer and the leader. Well, I made the decision whether to have him in the group or not. Was it better to have a a guy who was better than the people I had in, obviously, or not. And that decision was to let Paul in to make the group stronger. And I turned around to him right then on first meeting and said, do you want to join the group? And I think he said yes the next day. Now, George came through Paul. I said, well, I've got, I got, I've got this friend who's, who's really good, you know. And they said, well, yeah, like what? You know, I said, well, he can play raunchy. Perfectly. Down, 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 down. And we all love that song. So we said, well, got to, got to try him out. I remember we ended up on the top deck of a bus, empty, late night bus kind of thing, and just us there. And he said, go on, George, get your guitar out. Go on, you show him, man. I thought, you yeah. know. And he got it out. Down, 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 sure enough. Note perfect, raunchy, you're in. <laughs> thing we ever recorded was That'll Be The Day, Buddy Holly song, and one of Paul's called uh, In Spite Of All The Danger. And somewhere, it might be around, it's in Liverpool, somewhere that record, that's the actual first recording we ever made.
And so everybody hung round in this in this club in Liverpool called the Jacaranda, which is near the art school, near Paul and George's school, in the centre of Liverpool. And so we started hanging round there before we were really formed a band, you know, when there was just me, Paul and George. We used to show up for gigs with just three guitars, and the, uh, the person booking us would say, um, where's the drums then? And to cover this eventuality, we say, the rhythm's in the guitars. We, we once tried to do this audition for Carol Levis, there was this guy, Carol Levis Discoveries, and the scam really was, was that, you know, everybody would go on an audition and then they'd pick out somebody for, to, you know, out of the auditions, you say, okay, you, you, and you, and they'd pick out about probably 20 different acts to go on, and they'd have an audience, and then they'd have the clap on it, and whoever won would go on into the final, or come back next week, and it was just something that kept on going. We went in for one of those. So we were going up on the train from Liverpool to Manchester, rehearsing what we were going to do. And only me and George had our guitars. I think John he must have sold his or busted or something. He didn't have his with him. OK, there's just the two of us with the guitars. And as it happened, it looked good because Paul was, like, left-handed and I was right-handed and still am. And John was in the middle and, like, John stood there with a hand on each shoulder, you know. Think it over, what you just said. Ba, ba, ba. Me and George, John would do the lead, and we were also going to do Rave On. So we went, we did it, he put his arms around us and stuff, and it was OK. We didn't win, as usual, but I believe that day some unfortunate person in that uh, theatre was relieved of his guitar. Stuart was John's friend, mainly, from art college. Stuart was a very good painter. We were all slightly jealous of John's friendship. John being a little bit older, certainly than me, certainly than George. He was a little bit, you know... Uh, he wanted to sit next to him on a bus and stuff, like, he's the older fellow, you know, it's just the way it was. Now, so when, so when Stuart came in, it was a little bit of a sort of... He was sort of taking a little bit of that position away from us. We... So I had to take a little bit of a um, back seat. The famous stories were he sold his painting to John Moore exhibition or something like that. So the question was, what do you do with 75 quid? So we said, you know, that happens to be the exact amount it takes to buy a Hofner base, and that'd be a great thing to spend the money on. He said, no, no, I'm a painter. I've got to spend on paints and such like, you know. We said, no, Stuart, really? And John and I kind of gave him quite a sort of persuasive argument that the best thing to do, obviously, was to buy this Hofner bass, <laughs> which he did. He went and did that. And the um, only trouble was he couldn't play it. But it was better to have a bass player who um, couldn't play than to not have a bass player at all. 